Welcome to episode number 260 of Destination Linux. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill. I'm Ryan. And I'm Michael. Also with us just off camera, but piped in direct from Jitsi, is our glorious community of fact-checking, ego-busting patrons. And on this week's episode of Destination Linux, we're going to talk about the classics of the distro world. Then we're going to discuss some updates to Audacity, plus we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and more coming up right now on Destination Linux to keep those penguins marching. This week in our community feedback, we're taking some feedback direct from the discourse forums. And I thought this was really interesting because we have somebody on the show, one of the hosts, Jill, is kind of an <laughs> expert in this area. So I thought it would be perfect to bring this in and kind of let Jill take a look at this comment. But basically, the post is, are there any Blender users in the DLN community? Blender 3.0 is out. And honestly, it is so much more palatable to get into now ranging from typography, 3D modeling, sculpting, and 3D drawing. I know there is a photography section, so they're creative here. I think Michael has a graphic design background, so I was curious to know before I started posting donuts, bonsai trees, and hamburgers in the forum if there are <laughs> any users there. <laughs> now, I replied to this immediately because I am not very good at these type of things, but I'm a huge enthusiast. I use Blender for video editing and stuff like that, but as Michael will tell you, my design capabilities are slightly lacking when it comes to the graphical side a little I mean, bit. That, they could use a little work. I mean, just sure. a tad <laughs> bit of work. A little bit. Um, however, one of the individuals also in our community shared one of their anim animations named Bib, B-H-I-B-B, -B, and I thought it was just excellent. And I guess I'll go with this. Jill, you teach yeah. animation and things like this. So let's start with you. What was your take on Bib's animation that we saw from the community and Blender overall here? It has a really beautiful and nice composition, and I love the use of complementary colors using greens and violets. Very nice. That that that's something in the art world uh, we uh, as as teachers love. Um, and it has a really whimsical element to it to it, which is demonstrated by the girls' movement, the music, and the timing of the leaves with the music. And again, this is a really beautiful piece, and I would love to see this animation expanded. I, I had some ideas on, way you, on ways you can expand it. One of my tips is you can have more variable speeds with the falling leaves to make them look even more natural. In, in the particle system, you can kind of adjust it with a fractal movement and variable. And I can actually see this piece lengthen to at least 30 seconds with more animation of the leaves and a camera slowly moving into her face to show a closer view of her movement. And you can create a title to introduce the piece and a created by line of text with your name and fade to black with credits and music and have the music fade out. This will give your animation a more professional look and um, make a great piece for a demo reel. So you always want to have credits um, and titles uh, when you want to want to create a piece for a demo reel. And uh, I even thought you could have the leaves falling during the end credits to create visual harmony with the rest of the animation. And I, I and I wouldn't make these suggestions if I didn't love your animation so much. Great job! It's really a beautiful piece, and I could just see it even longer and expanded to more greatness. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I, thought, I thought it was absolutely gorgeous when I looked yes. at it. And I love some of your tips because they're things I would never think about. And I guess that's why you're a professor and I'm not. But Jill, the most important thing here, <laughs> what grade are we going to give Bib here? Are we, are we talking an <laughs> F, a D, oh, an A? What, what, we've got to no, give a score is, here. Oh, no, it is an A. Absolutely. Oh, right. It's, it's Bib, beautiful. You if you, if he was one of my beginning students and he, he, that was his first piece he gave me, that would have been an A. <laughs> oh, awesome. Nice. Yeah. Well, look, I think that that's a brilliant feedback that you gave. I also love this post because I am such a fan of Blender and yes. the things you could do with this tool. I've always wanted to learn more and do more with this. And it's, it's <laughs> like 
I don't. I almost look at it like Excel in a way because that's more my professional world. Spend a lot of time in spreadsheets and things where uh, there's so many different facets to Excel. There are so many different variables and pieces of it that you can mm -hmm. learn. You could be good at graphing. You could be good at the macro side of it. You could be good at charting side. There's so many different variables, and Blender's very much like that. Like it, mm -hmm. there's so much you can do with this tool. Uh, and, and take your time to learn. But I love seeing the creativity of our community out there with the animations and things they could do. So I hope we get a lot more of these submissions. And maybe even somebody will take Blender and create the the DLN or Linux Out Loud, the new oh, DLN Extend yes. Linux Out Loud logo with Blender because they have a competition going right now on the forums where you can they're trying to get a new logo because DLN Extend is becoming Linux Out Loud. They're going to change the name of it. And so... Blender would be a really cool tool to use to make their new uh, logo. Potentially. Yeah, 3D version of the logo. That'd be awesome. I mean, there's. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to be uh, posted on the forum for that because Blender is, uh, as as we've all pointed out, it's 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 fantastic. Blender is amazing. The fact that it's been around so long, and it continues to get better and better. And the latest version of Blender that we talked about in the previous episode, mm -hmm. because it's it's just gotten so much easier to use, as was mentioned in this forum thread. That it's just. I mean, okay. It's gotten easier to use than the previous version of Blender. It's not easy to use necessarily. You still <laughs> got to learn how to do 3D software and animations and all that stuff. So it's just slightly easier than it was before. I'll, I'll, yeah. just, I'll rephrase it that way. It definitely is. But but in, in the animation world, they want you minimally to um, have at least three to five years of experience with, with a program. Whether it be Blender, whether whether it be Maya, whether it be Moto, Blender, you're always learning. Just like other um, animation and graphics programs, you'll always be learning. Just like you do in Linux, whether you're compiling a kernel <laughs> or developing software, you're always going to be learning. The animation programs are so complex, and they really take years to master. <laughs> and in the meantime of learning those things, they're going to be adding more and more stuff while you're doing exactly it. so. One of my favorite things of this latest release, Blender 3.0, is that the cycles, GPU kernels, now render two to eight times faster in real-world scenes. In other words, it renders faster now. <laughs> yeah. And Blender was always one of, the, one of the fastest renderers in the industry. I mean, honestly, it's faster than Maya and Moto and 3D Studio Max. It always has been. And because it's more memory efficient, it's faster at launching and faster at doing all the things. But this is even, you know, this is a huge improvement. And they've cleaned up the user interface. They've, um, there's shadow improvements on low polygon game models, which is wonderful. There's a new asset browser. And there's just so many great new features and updates. We can't even mention them all. <laughs> so oh, yeah. make sure to check the show notes for the official Blender 3.0 link. Yes, yeah. it's extensive. <laughs> like if, you, if you just read verbatim, word for word on that blog post, it will take yeah. about 10 minutes to get to it. 10 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a lot yeah. of stuff. <laughs> And yeah, so for all of you out there who don't know, I've actually been teaching animation for 30 years. And I've worked in the television, film, and gaming industries doing everything from animation, modeling, visual effects, editing, and programming. So I've been doing this a long time and was well, kind of one of the first, well, I was one of the first women to be doing this. <laughs> It's so, amazing. And I, yeah. it never ceases to amaze me the stuff that you're involved in. I think Michael had a new revelation just this week talking to you like, oh, and Jill did this before too. Uh, yep. it, it happens all the time. But I think every conversation awesome at least once that you, you do so many amazing things here. And I think this is a great opportunity for the community, right? Because what an honor to be graded by Jill Aww. in the forum, right? You get <laughs> so now submit your animations there on that and see if Professor Jill will give you an A as big. Bib got yeah. an A. There <laughs> and also to make animation. sure that we can we can protect the curve, Ryan and I are going to post some stuff on there to make sure there's at least somebody oh, getting an girl. F. <laughs> somebody gets an F, right. <laughs> Both of us, probably. <laughs> Your first project will to be uh, get getting a sphere moving across the screen and then exploding it and maybe what? shooting it at Michael or Michael can shoot <laughs> Ooh, it at Ryan. <laughs> that, that's an interesting suggestion. How about, what if I were to give you a fully well-developed polygon of a three-dimensional cube via Blender. 
for those who don't understand that joke, that's yes. what you start with when you open it. That's what you start with, yeah. <laughs> yes. Nice. Or it could be a, a sphere on a checkerboard floor. That, that's the classic in the industry. <laughs> yeah. That high resolution sphere or a teapot. <laughs> Michael, go with go with the stool, Michael. You need to do oh, the yeah. render yes. of a stool, and we'll, stool. yeah, Absolutely. we'll do a competition and see who could get the best grade. By the way, do you know what Jill gives an A to every single time they submit something? Who's that? Digital Ocean, ah, who is the absolutely. sponsor of this episode. Yeah. Now's the perfect time to dive into the Digital Ocean, their new app platform. Jill gave an A plus two. And the service helps you build modern cloud native apps for way less money. With that platform, you could build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites faster and easier than ever before using a simple and intuitive interface. Simply point the app platform to your GitHub or GitLab repository and let it do all the heavy lifting for you. Whether you're using Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, Docker, and container images, it does it all. By running app platform, they also help keep the infrastructure costs down. Plus, it's built on top of DigitalOcean Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path so you could take more control of your infrastructure setup as well as a Destination Linux listener and a member of the DLN community. They're going to give you $100 to check this app platform out. They also have the one-click marketplace where if you want to deploy a droplet and have things already set up, you want a WordPress site, it's a one-click drop. It's going to set it all up for you. It's so simple and intuitive. You've got to go check it out for yourself. Go to do.co slash DLN. That's do.co slash DLN. You need to go there specifically because that's where you're going to get your $100 credit to try out all of these awesome services. And we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. And today we're going to talk about something I think is going to be really interesting. We're going to have like a, a big topic to discuss the classic distros that are available in the Linux world. And basically it's like, you know, classics never die kind of thing. So when we say that they never die, we mean it because there are some distributions that have been around for years, uh, <laughs> as almost as long as the Linux kernel itself. Uh, there are distros that have gone through the test of time and are still around today. So let's talk about them. Uh, who wants to start it off? Which which distro do you want to start off, start off as well? Because we have so many different options. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Ryan suggested as this is a topic that we wanted to discuss. And I kind of felt like, uh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go through all these different things. I'm going to test multiple versions and like maybe even derivatives and all that. And then it kind of sucked me into this nostalgia vortex so I started looking at, at, at distributions that I used back in the day that actually aren't still around, but I still wanted to try them out. So I got a, I got one of those for later at the end of this segment that it's oh, going to be nice. fun. nice. You're going to break <laughs> some from the past there. What I exactly. like is I've, out of everybody here, I've been in Linux the least amount of time. I've only been, what, four or five years in Linux in its entirety. So I don't have any of this history, but everyone we interviewed... There's so much history there that I hear about. And a lot of people get started because they found a CD sitting on a magazine, for instance. But the one I want to hear about that I most often comes up in somebody who's been in Linux for a long time's journey is Slackware. <laughs> yes. And so I got to play with Slackware and I could give you some of my impressions of it. I feel like it was a really fun journey down some nostalgia lane here. But Jill, I need to hear it from you because this was, of course, a very popular distro back in the day. In fact, one of the most popular distros. So tell us about Slackware. Let's start there. Okay, so Slackware launched in 1992 by Patrick Volkerding, and it is the oldest surviving Linux distro. And until the mid-1990s, it had about 80% share of the market. And Slackware is a lot of people's first introduction to Linux, you know, including mine. You know, I started with Slackware in 1993, and because it was my first Linux distro, it has a special place in my heart. And getting 24 three and a half floppy disk images installed and working correctly. <laughs> Wait a minute, you said out. 24 disks to install yes. it? <laughs> there, there's a reason for that, why there was 24, and I will tell you in a few minutes. Okay, <laughs> A few seconds. So. And uh, the other cool thing is I didn't blow up my CRT in the process with the XF86 config file. <laughs> that had happened to people, believe it or not, <laughs> back in the day. Slackware is extremely fast, nimble, and stable. And its goal is to be the most Unix-like distribution. And 
There are no official repositories for Slackware. The only official packages Slackware provides are available on the installation media. So that's why there are 24 three and a half floppy disks when you first <laughs> for the first version to install it. All right. By the way, that later increased to over 70 floppy disks in the 90s. Wow. <laughs> I think one of the biggest programs I ever installed with floppy disks was like Wing Commander. You remember that? Oh, Wing yeah. Commander had yeah. like a dozen or so. I don't think it was 24. That's quite an extensive. <laughs> yeah. You think about all the packages being included and the little amount of data it could hold. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There was actually a joke for probably about, I think last, I think it got, they stopped doing it maybe 10 years ago or something, but there was a lot of mm -hmm. distros would continue to release stuff on floppy disks to the point where there was like 250 floppy disks. Like, why are you still doing this? Yeah, why are you still? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and another unique thing about Slackware is its package management system. It's called PKG Tools. Install using install PKG, upgrade using upgrade PKG, and remove packages using remove PKG packages from local sources. That's not a terrible syntax that they have no. set up there. It makes great sense. Not the worst. Yeah, it, that's and, and pretty good for, you know, one of the very first Linux distros and one of yeah. the first Linux distros that Linus himself used. But there are actually many third-party repositories repositories for Slackware. So some are standalone repositories and others are for distributions that are Slackware based but retain package compatibility with Slackware. Thank goodness, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> so Slackware itself does not incorporate official tools to resolve dependencies. Some unofficial community supported software tools do provide this function, similar to the way Apt does for Debian based distributions. I know we're about to talk about something that I, I can't wait to because it's the name is so great. Yes, it is. It's, it's just it's a, it's a it's a reference of Apt because it kind of uses Apt and it kind of also has its own custom thing, but it's Absolutely. slapped. Yes. Absolutely. So, so slapped good. get is an option and, and G slapped, which is the graphical G interface slapped. for slapped get. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that's great. G slapped. Yeah. I so, love it. So when you install um, something, you get slapped. <laughs> G slapped. <laughs> G, G slapped. slapped. <laughs> and I was so excited because I, I actually eagerly installed the Slackware 15 release candidate 2 back in November. That was huge because when Slackware 15 is officially released, it will be the first stable released since Slackware Linux 14.2 back in July of 2016. Hey boy, we thought, we thought Debian <laughs> was slow at updating stuff. Yeah. Slackware <laughs> takes the cake here. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little bit longer. Yeah, it's actually, yeah. The, that's also a point release from the 2016. If you go yes. back to the actual 14, if you compare 14 to 15, <laughs> I think that's like 10 or 11 years. Yeah, definitely. And I just, I love that the Slackware installer still uses a CLI. I think that is so cool. You know, you know Debian what also gives uses you the CLI installer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Arch. Just point at my Arch. hat, yeah. Yes. And, but, I didn't but of say course, oh my goodness. <laughs> when I installed those original floppy disks, it was a text-based installer that was very archaic. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. Uh, and... and Playing with it was interesting <laughs> because if you try to install something today in a modern package manager, you take for granted the fact of them being able to resolve and find dependencies for you. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. imagine, as I was playing with Slackware, of course, I was having fun. It wasn't on a main machine. There was nothing at risk or serious about it. So I was having fun with it. But trying to install a package and then track down all of the various dependencies mm -hmm. It was libraries. kind of a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. It, yep. it was a nightmare. And, but I mean, like I said, I had fun with it because again, I'm, I'm looking back at what things were and I didn't realize at the time that, cause I wasn't really doing no own research. I was really just trying to explore to somebody getting into this by themselves without having the access when Slackware first came out to all of the internet and being able to search things super easily. Yeah. That didn't wasn't have that option. Wasn't an option. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I had fun with it. The install didn't shock me at all. I use Arch. So uh, having to manually configure uh, my drives for installation and things is something I was really used to. Uh, and so that didn't bother me at all. It was kind of neat to see that. I played with KDE on Slackware. And um, yeah, nice. I just kind of imagined myself being back then 
playing with this tool and using it and it being something that obviously had a major impact on a lot of people's lives back then to the point where we hear so many developers and people we interview on this show talking about starting with Slackware, including you, Jill, right? Yeah. One of your first distro. So it left an impression on so many people back then when it was released and it's still around today. Yes. The question I have is, and it may be something for the community, I don't know if any of us can answer, is there something today? I'm happy Slackware is around. I think it's really cool, but I kept asking my question, is there something Slackware does today better than other distros, or is it just kind of kept around as a, I don't know, monument of time, if you will? I I would say that the fact that it 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 puts the Unix philosophy first does make it unique. Yeah. And it is very fast and nimble because once you, you know, it, it's very memory efficient, you know, compiling your own packages and, and um, libraries. And as a result of that, it is just so fast. Honestly, it's the fastest, <laughs> one of the fastest Linux distros out there. It really is. Interesting. Because once of that. you have and it, it runs, set up. <laughs> once you have it set up and it runs really well on uh, uh, older hardware. So just like, you know, Linux does in general, but Slackware runs really well on old hardware. <laughs> Personally, I think like the, the biggest uh, value that Slackware has still in terms of like the current modern times of computing is that it has the ability to be used on hardware, like Jill said, that you would normally not find a distro be able to support it. Like there are some, exactly. like all the main modern yeah. distros are not going to support like super ancient stuff. And if you want to be able to run anything on those, you would need a distro like Slackware that has that legacy stuff still set up. And I do think that there's a value to that. I mean, I'm I personally, I like mm -hmm. not having to do everything manually <laughs> as I install everything. I, I kind of, you know, my preference is to like say, I want to install this and then it does. But uh, maybe I'm just spoiled. But so. sometimes you actually lose appreciation for all the oh work. yeah yeah for sure you know Take so yes i agree yeah. with you i would not go back to that <laughs> it did really make me appreciate how far our package managers and things have come to resolve yeah. those issues mm -hmm. for us yeah. for sure but also like the point about you know it had to start somewhere and slackware mm -hmm. was basically the start one of the starting points of what we eventually became desktop linux they're having to create something before anyone else and well not necessarily they weren't the first official distro but they were one of the like the one they're the longest running one so the other ones that were made before slackware are no longer around but it's just it's interesting because they you have to start somewhere and to be able to build on top of that is something that i think is awesome as a testament to slackware because there are you know tons of benefits to having slackware as, as something still around when we're talking about like the legacy and the having the hardware still support. But I also think it's important to note that without Slackware, you know, we wouldn't have had these, the stepping stone of say, hey, well, how can we do this packaging better? How can we get rid of this manual dependency Absolutely. checking and stuff like that? So yep. true. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it, Michael. Also, by the way, I did try some uh, derivatives of Slackware and I tried yes. three of them. And <laughs> Good. <laughs> two of them were uh, based on 14.2. So they kind of had a little bit of uh, some, you know, too, too old of packages, but everything. Uh, <laughs> so one of them actually was, um, uh, had uh, KDE Plasma 5 or 4.14. Oh. And it was yeah. like going back in time, like, oh, I remember this day. Uh, let's, Do you have let's to click on the AOL icon to connect to the internet. <laughs> I mean, come yeah. on. I had to use uh, the AIM mess instant messenger yeah. for sure. Uh, but it's really cool because there are, there are it's it's really kind of like a fun it's like a time capsule you can go check out like how things were and they're still being maintained even now. Uh, but there is one that I found because uh, Jill mentioned it. We were talking earlier this week. Uh, she said, check out SlackX. And I had heard of SlackX because I've heard of the developer making a bunch of different versions that they have like uh, SlackX, there's DebX, and a bunch of other ones. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised by this one because it's based on Slackware 15 already. And it has the latest version of XFCE and the latest version of Plasma and a bunch of other stuff. Although the only thing I didn't like about SlapX mm -hmm. is that it didn't have GSlapped installed unless you use the OpenBox edition. So it was a little bit more, it was like newer stuff, but harder to use. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Yeah, so take... the Enlightenment um, version also has uh, uh, G-slapped oh, as okay. well. Nice. And for those of you out Gosh, there, G-slapped, it's it's like using the Synaptic, Synaptic Package yep. Manager. So it it's for those of you that are used to using Synaptic, you'll feel right at home with G-slapped. Sure. Also, uh, they some of them have sorcery, which is a essentially oh, yeah. like Synaptic, but for uh, Slack builds, which is kind of like Slackware's AUR sort of thing. And it's uh, really interesting because you like I don't think Slack X had sorcery, but you could just install source if you wanted to. Now you're just making stuff up. This isn't Harry Potter <laughs> sorcery. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. But what's interesting about Slack X though is that it's made by a developer uh, named Arn Exton. I've seen Arn Exton makes uh, tons of different distributions over <laughs> so the years. So many. So I think the last time I counted was like 18. Yeah, I think that's what that it was. Sounds about right. There are so many. But I haven't ever tried the Slackware version, and I gotta say, it's it's the most usable Slackware that I've tried. So, uh, well done, Mister Exton. Well, I yeah. invite the community and everyone to go experience what we did because this was kind of a idea I had to go back and es- explore mm-hmm. the classics that are still alive today. And I didn't know how it would go, but seeing Jill's notes just grow and Mike's yeah. notes grow and seeing <laughs> yeah, everybody so this much. week spend so much time in these distros was so fun for all of us. And I invite you to go back and look at some of these things. because, And also in the forums, if you want to post some of the things that when I ask the question, what's something Slackware does really well that other distros don't do, I would love to get if somebody's using Slackware for something specific. But we've got other ones to cover here. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to Debian. Jill, I know you know nothing about Debian at all. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not one of your favorites. She, she of did all not time. have a chance to check it out. Yeah, you didn't have a yeah. chance to check it out at but. all. Uh, <laughs> but Debian, of course, was one of the first Linux distros as well out there. So if you're a Debian user, you're uh, kind of u- utilizing one of the very first Linux distros. It was announced on August 16th, 1993 by Ian Murdoch, uh, though the first stable version wasn't released until 1996 on there. Mm-hmm. They have a really cool project history link on the Debian website that you can go check out that kind of takes you through the history of the tool. So I invite you, we'll have a link in the show notes to check that out. Uh, Besides being one of the oldest distros out there, it also has one of the largest repositories with 51,000 packages available for Debian. And I will say, I've been messing with Debian a lot lately because it runs really well as I've been doing testing on the Mac ARM uh, Mm -hmm. device. So the new Mac M1s that use their new Apple ARM silicon, they Debian runs very, very well on those, uh, utilizing UTM and things like that. But as an Arch user, of course, I prefer to use SID version of Debian because I want to be on the edge. And I feel like the SID people in the Debian world, <laughs> we're all one. Like Arch and SID people can hang out all the time. We're we're kind of the same. We accept each other. They're like distant cousins. You know? <laughs> Ryan likes the those unstable vibes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why you gotta call it unstable? It's just we're on the edge. Jill. That's we're on what the branch is called. Stable on the edge. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, what the branch is called. Like Sid is Don't actually bring your facts Sid in here, is Michael. actually called unstable. <laughs> <laughs> so with Debian, I actually like to run stable or testing. So yes, there are three branches in Debian: stable, testing, and unstable. <laughs> <laughs> AKA Sid, Ryan. Yes, AKA Sid. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. But it's not unstable. That's what I'm telling you. It's very yeah, stable. It's, very, it's labeled as such. So, I mean, it could be labeled that, but it's still stable. <laughs> They're wrong. They need to relabel yeah. it. Yeah, they do. They also need stable. to change stable to static. That'd be better. Yes. Oh, that would be yeah, way yeah. better. Yeah. That, that's that's a whole episode in itself. <laughs> we need to stop episode. calling yeah. unstable versus stable because a lot of this stuff is very stable, but. Yep. Static versus unstatic. <laughs> Would it be <Yes>. unstatic? <laughs> <laughs> Unstat. Uh, how about rolling? Unstatic. Just call it rolling. Rolling. Or, there we go. Or, static and rolling. Or good luck. Yeah. Good. <laughs> That's so rude. The, Mike. <laughs> the nice thing well, about you're t- wishing good luck to someone. That's not rude. <laughs> yeah. You'll bring us back on course. Oh, so <laughs> so testing is actually really very stable yeah. and contains packages that haven't been accepted into a stable release yet, but are in the queue. And testing has more recent versions of so- software than stable, which is really nice. And of course, unstable SID has even 
more <laughs> recent where <laughs> I want to live. Yes. <laughs> And currently, Debbie and Eleven Stable is called Bullseye, and Debbie Debbie and Eleven Testing is Bookworm, and Unstable is Sid. Names from Toy Story, one of my very favorite <laughs> animation movies. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. Uh, but the the Sid one is always Sid. They never change the name of that one. But uh, and that's the little kid <laughs> next door who has all the little monster toys. And actually, yes. I would say uh, unpopular opinion. It's not. He's not a bad kid if you think about it. He didn't yeah. know that they were alive. You know what I'm saying? He's, exactly. he's just hacking, but he's doing it in a exactly. mean way. <laughs> he's creative. He is creative, yeah. not unstable. You're saying yeah. Sid is the Bow Weaver of the kid world? Uh, sure. He's just hacking. Of the Toy Bo Story nice. world? Sure. Why not? <laughs> Bow is nice. Interesting. No. <laughs> what I find interesting with Debian, too, is that a lot of Arch users who maybe they start in Arch or they leave or they want to try something different, a lot of them go to Debian. Yeah. Which Absolutely. is kind of funny to me because Debian oftentimes mm-hmm. looked at like a very delayed distro with older packages and stuff. But mm-hmm. a lot of Arch users, get if they get frustrated with Arch or they want to try something different, you'll see in the forums they go to Debian SID or they go to Debian. And so it, it's very interesting that that's kind of a jumping off point because the two seem very unrelated in a lot of aspects outside of that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I do think mm-hmm. that Debian has a lot of value in terms of like having different architectures and, you know, being able to be put it on pretty much anything at this point, even, you know, stuff I hadn't even heard of in some cases. Uh, there's so many different <laughs> ways you could use Debian. And I think that there is a ton of value for Debian for people who want to use it. But for personally, for me, the package availability is not uh, where I want, you know, I want stuff to move as fast as possible, provided it is not that as fast as Ryan wants, because I'm <laughs> a contrarian, apparently. Uh, but <laughs> no rolling. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> well, I could roll a little bit. Yeah, he but, can roll a little bit. Like but it's interesting. You, you were yeah, you were saying about how people use uh, who are arch users would switch Debian Sid. I think that I've seen more people do what the next one we want to talk about is SUSE related because they switched over That's to true. OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, for example. And I think that you know because of SUSE, SUSE has been around for many years, and it was originally known as SUSE, just SUSE Linux. And which is in, another interesting thing is that I'm pretty sure if I'm, I might remember remembering it correctly, but I think so that SUSE started as a derivative of Slackware. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And then it became its mm-hmm. own thing later. And then eventually it became OpenSUSE. And now we have OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And, you know, we have Leap as well. The growth that, op- that SUSE and OpenSUSE has had since its early days has been like enormous. And I think that there's a lot of great stuff to check out on uh, OpenSUSE. Uh, especially with like, if you want rolling, tumbleweed is a great thing I mean, to check out. Open SUSE is so good and so modern; it's hard to think that this is a classic that we're still using today. Right? Mm-hmm. It's hard to put yeah. that in your mind. I think Open SUSE is the most undervalued distro in all of Linux. It's undervalued by the community. It's undervalued in its use. It's undervalued in its market share, which it has a lot. But it's so good that it should be way bigger. It should be talked about way more than it is. I absolutely love Yast. I love the accessibility to all the administrative tools in one area, the firewall, the user management, the software repositories, all in one area, hypervisors, remote management. If you're wanting to get into administration of Linux and servers and things and understand them, but you don't know where to start, you don't know what tools to install, I think OpenSUSE is a fantastic starting place because you have all the administrative pieces right there within Yast that you can start exploring and playing with and understanding and unraveling that world. On top of that, you have a rolling. This is one of the first mm-hmm. distros that kind of proved my point that I keep trying to make to a lot of those who've been in Linux a long time uh, and are stuck on, I think, some very old ideals that you can have rolling and you can have stability. Those two things can coexist. And I think OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is a perfect proof of that situation there, that those two things can happen. So there's a lot of value in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And Michael, I see those little uh, face thing you're making, and I'm He's about waiting. to I'm about He's to g slap it off your face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I actually do agree. I just wanted to mess with <laughs> Ryan because I know he was paying attention. But uh, I do think that Open Source Tumbleweed is awesome, and there's it. It's actually for me, if I was going to use a rolling distribution, it would be Open Source Tumbleweed because of the 
uh, snapshots and rollbacks they stuff they do with ButterFS and the snapper tool. That that stuff that stuff is just so interesting. The fact that you can have a system that's rolling and something go really wrong and break, and you go, eh, no big deal. Just roll back to the previous version and get to go and everything. Such such an awesome distribution for people who are wanting to have that bleeding edge, but also wanting to have like a safety net of the snapshotting system. And also they have a lot of cool features. Like my favorite to talk about is, you know, actually, I don't know. There's two that I can't really decide which one is more interesting. There's the open QA system and then there's the OBS or the open build system, not to be confused with OBS studio, but (laughs) this is awesome. OBS is awesome because it allows you to build all kinds of different packages. You create a single spec file, open up the set up the the software to get the source code from the Git or whatever. And it'd be able to like build all sorts of packages for pretty much every distribution and even be able to do it for app images. And I flat think flat packs can or be built there too. Uh, there's so many cool things you can use uh, to build on OBS, but the open QA thing is also so interesting. Phenomenal. It's yeah. basically an automated testing system that uh, uh, not even just open uses it also Fedora uses it. And what it does is that you can create these scenarios of saying, okay, here, test this code, build it, make sure it runs and works, but also do these different things with the mouse and the keyboard automatically on the system, and it will record a video to demonstrate what happens in that process. That is such an awesome thing that if you are building a distribution and you are you know, wanting to have some kind of testing system built in, just check out OpenQA because, I mean, at this point, based on everything I've looked at it, it looks like it should be available. It, like everybody should use it, every distro. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I I love Zipper actually. I like Yast mm-hmm. too, but I like Zipper, the command line package manager, because it's 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 actually really good with with remote software management tasks or managing software from shell sh- shells shell scripts. <laughs> you get it. Uh, so, and I've been using OpenSUSE on my Blade servers for animation rendering and on the desktop of several of my machines, running both KDE and XFCE. I'm curious about that, Jill. Is there a specific reason you chose to put OpenSUSE on your Blade servers for animation rendering? Was it just to try it, or is it actually better at those tasks that you need it for than other distros you've tried? No, just test? just to to try it and okay. have uh, multiple. I also have a rail in my my chain of my render farm. <laughs> She also wanted to use the tumbleweed version because it's usually, it's a blade server, so she wants the bleeding yeah. edge of it. The ah, bleeding edge. nice! Yeah. I like how you put that to coordinated that, Jill. That's pretty smart. Aww. Well, you mentioned Rel also being on your servers, and this yeah. is the last one we wanted to cover today. So, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the successor of Red Hat Linux, which is one of the oldest Linux distros out there. Now, messing with RHEL on the server that actually Michael has now, actually has RHEL that I gave to Michael, has been really Mm -hmm. fun. And it was very familiar immediately to me as somebody who spent a lot of time in Fedora. That just To me, I was able to get around and start utilizing things uh, instantly, like DNF, which I absolutely Mm -hmm. adore. DNF, I think, is one of the best out there. I'm going to go ahead and say it's the best. Yeah, I I just... DNF is awesome. (laughs) <laughs> it, it really is. It is one of the best, yeah. <laughs> when you start learning the syntax for DNF, a lot of it just makes a lot of sense Also, just the functionality it has is crazy. Like, there's the, the, there's one thing I found that blew my mind, that you has a, a history system. So, it, like, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't be able to... It's not necessarily a rollback thing, but it can, like, reprocess things in reverse. So, like, if you install something, you can do uh, DNF uh, history, history list uh, undo last something like that. I can't remember exactly the syntax, but I'll have it in the show notes. Yeah. And it basically will just take whatever you just did and then reverse it and uninstall or do whatever you whatever you were doing. And it will just do it in reverse. And it's so interesting. And you can also like undo anything at any point based on the history system. It's such a interesting approach to doing it. But also the thing I love the most is that its upgrade system is, you know how apt has apt update and apt upgrade? And uh, DNF has just DNF upgrade. And the difference is with apt, you have to upgrade the repos and the mirrors and all that stuff before you do the upgrade of the packages. Whereas DNF just says, just looks at when you, when you run the command, it'll look at how long since you lasted the update and will just automatically do the update if it needs to. And like, 
that's how all of them should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, change it, all to uh, the package managers, uh, developers to all of the other ones. Uh, consider making it where it just detects if it needs it or not, because that's awesome. Very simple. Yeah. I got one question to kind of go back as we look at all of these distros here. The one thing that kept driving me a little mad is the fact that so many distros, the most popular distros arguably, are based on Debian, but Debian itself Mm -hmm. is not the most popular distro. How can so many things be based on Debian, but Debian itself be not be more popular than those things if everybody's basing off of them? And so that's the question that kept resonating through my mind. OpenSUSE, most underrated. RHEL, all of this stuff made sense. But Debian's the one that stuck out the most for me because of that. Well, my theory about that is Mm -hmm. that Debian is, while really interesting and has a lot of value, I do think that its policies of how how fast it does things and the way it does things just holds back uh, people from using it because they'd have to wait for so long to get certain things. Uh, like, for example, Pipewire, you still can't get Pipewire in Debian or anything based on Debian properly. You can get yeah. some parts of Pipewire. You can get the Pulse audio stuff, but the Jack stuff doesn't work yet. So when, you, when you're looking into like different pieces like that, it just takes longer for those things to come into the distribution. So uh, there are reasons why people use Ubuntu instead is because Ubuntu kind of does like a a patch thing on top of Debian to improve it and make it easier to use for a variety of different factors. Oh, the Pipewire thing actually isn't in Ubuntu either, but other things are improved and patched and that sort of stuff. So yeah. I think that's why people are more, you know, you'll see more people using Ubuntu or derivatives of Ubuntu rather than Debian or even maybe directly derivatives of Debian. Yeah, and you know, to to touch back what we talked about earlier on what we talked about earlier, one of the reasons why I like Debian so much is that is it is the Swiss Army knife of all distros and does support almost all architectures, like Michael was talking about it. And I can install Debian on almost all of my computers in my hardware museum, which makes me happy. <laughs> See, there's so many reasons why when you talk yeah. about this stuff and you think about it, like why isn't this not that Debian's not popular, it's, it's yeah. very popular, but so many distros are based on Debian based off and are it. so much more popular than Debian itself, which is odd to me because the thing that everything's based on should be the most popular, I would think. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. But I, I think they pride themselves on being the core, you know, the core OS that so many are based on. And, you know, one of the reasons that stable actually has a much old has much older packages that's been brought up before here on the show. It's because it takes time for the developers to port and test them to work on so many different architectures. Yeah. So that's why they're not just porting to x86. They have you know about 10 they have to port to and it takes a while to set up those packages for each of the architectures. I've talked to a few Debian developers who say that they look at it more as a foundation distro rather than Yeah. That's interesting. Core distro, yeah. I always look at it (laughs) eagerly of seeing what Debian could be, you know, as far as being the most popular distro out there. But if that's not their goal, then, you know, let it not be their goal. But it is kind of cool to see that Debian can run on all of that stuff in your museum. And there's so many awesome things to it. And I've enjoyed my time with Mm -hmm. it. So, Uh, but that's it. That's our trip down memory lane. Oh, no, it's not. We got some more things. I told you earlier in the show that I tried some stuff that, isn't still around, and oh, I have to tell right. you about them. Yes. <laughs> uh, before I do that, I wanted to say that Red Hat is a rail is awesome in terms of like it's an enterprise distribution. But you, when you install it, you can't really even tell. Uh, I also tried out the first version that Red Hat zero point nine from nice. that they released uh, on their blog post, and in the little snippet of the blog post, it says try at your try your hand at getting it to boot with your favorite virtualization solution. And the reason they said try is because it's very hard to do, and I couldn't get it to boot. <laughs> and I tried like four different solutions, and I gave up. I'm like, never mind, it's not going to work. But what I did get to work is Mandrake. Mandrake Woo-hoo! Linux. I tried 8.0, and it was awesome. Uh, it well, okay, it's awesome considering it was the 90s, and it it, it was uh, I think it was like 99 or something that was released. But it was a KDE 2.0. And I, uh, I loved like the experience of just playing around with the, the older distribution because like I'm not typically a person who wants to have like the, 
most uh, hardcore experience and build it all up myself or whatever. But Mandrake is really interesting because it was that type of thing of like, uh, it was like, I guess the Ubuntu of the 90s. Like they were working on making it easier to set up and easier to use. So the installer was pretty fair, straightforward and stuff like that. I mean, it was still kind of specific because it was the 90s, right? So you had to still pick which monitor you had and what resolution you wanted and stuff from the installer. But it was very easy to do. It and was guiding you. Yeah, it was <laughs> guiding you. It was just point and click and that was it. And uh, Mandrake was a, a thing that I liked using back in the day because it basically provided that option. Like when, when I first started, I first started with distributions that were not simple to use. And when I found Mandrake, it was just, oh, oh. yes. Uh, but that's, that's, the kind, that's why I went back and tried it again because as soon as we were talking about like classics, like I have to try this anyway. Yeah, that's so true, Michael. You know, I used to recommend new users of Linux to install the Red Hat based Mandrake Linux back in the late 1990s because it had the easiest to use installer and great hardware detection of any distro at the time. Yeah, that, that was something that we were fighting with back in the day to get our sound cards to work and our we're video still cards still fighting to work with properly. it a little bit, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, and one thing I wanted to mention about RHEL, one of the most important things about RHEL is Red Hat commercialized Linux and created the whole ecosystem for making money using Linux by offering payment for services and great customer support. So without Red Hat and RHEL, Linux wouldn't be where it is today. For the, sure. All their innovations and all their progress is Very just, good point. And yeah. a lot of people don't know that a ton of important pieces that make the system even work are yes. from the development and work of Red Hat over the years. Because Red Hat doesn't make a big fuss about it. Like, mm -hmm. they've They're made quiet. so many yeah. things that they are the ones who make PipeWire. They also made Pulse Audio originally. Uh, like, they're doing all sorts of stuff, and they have been for years, but they don't make a big fuss about it. But it's so critical to the ecosystem that, I, again, we, we should, you know, like, the thank them for their efforts, as well as the efforts from the other distributions like SUSE and Debian. They're, they're doing a lot of great stuff that makes it possible to have the modern distributions that we all love and enjoy thanks to the work that they've been doing for as long as they have. Yep. Absolutely. Also, to something to be thankful for is the sponsor of this episode, and that is Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is an awesome password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do it? Well, it provides you a bunch of different tools. For example, you have a secured vault where you can store all of your passwords in. You can have an auto generator to build those passwords and also an even automatically fill in passwords on login forms so you don't have to do any of this stuff. Plus, it works on many different devices, whether it's your mobile applications, web browser extensions, desktop applications, or even on the command line. And Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your devices. This is super important because it means that you know you're the only person with access to your data. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And also, I mentioned you can get it started for free, but I think you should check out their premium account because for less than a dollar per month, that's right, less than a dollar per month, you get one gigabyte one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, Priority Customer Service, so much more. Bitwarden Send. I mean, there's so much. And also there's the family plans, the business plans. There's so many great things you can do where you can actually help people set up their Bitwarden for them. So you can set up a family plan so you can help them and also even be able to share passwords back and forth. Bitwarden is just fantastic. So check it out by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN and make the smart move like many of the community have. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination. Linux. So in the news this week, we're going to talk about Audacity. Audacity has released a new version, which is 3.1.3, and it is quite an improvement. There are a lot of differences in this latest version. Uh, so it's not just uh, you know a bug fix version. It's there's tons of cool stuff. There's improved performance, which is always nice, especially with Audacity. There, you know, it has some issues of some, sometimes having times where it has uh, takes forever to load, that is no longer an issue in, uh, in some cases. Loading in projects especially should be now like 50 times faster compared to the previous okay. version. Uh, they also added snap guides for resizing clips, added new shortcuts for looping, and so much more. And I think Audacity is a fantastic application and has been around for a long time, which is, again, a classics type of topic, a topic we've been talking about for this episode. And Audacity is one of those things. However, it has had a little bit of drama in the past few months. And yeah, uh, some of that drama actually came up recently, I think, on our discourse forum about the telemetry. 
mm-hmm. because Audacity got bought by Muse Group, and then the Muse Group was trying to add some telemetry enablement, I think, by default into Audacity. Uh, but after the community grabbed their pitchforks and torches and said, no, we will not have it, uh, Muse Group backed off on this. So Audacity, mm-hmm. I, I think, is still safe to utilize uh, today, and it's one of my favorite projects out there uh, that I utilize every single week. Every time I'm editing a new Hardware Addicts episode, yeah. for instance, I'm in Audacity. I will tell you, though, Jill, this reminded me of the conversation we are having earlier with Blender. When a new version comes out and they change something, mm-hmm. uh, how that can really throw you when you're really used to a program. So I love all the changes that they made, but you used to have... Um, and I don't remember what it was a tool in Audacity that allowed you to move the clip. Like if you wanted to move the whole clip, like an oh, end song, yeah. you would click it. It was like uh, two arrows uh, connected together with a line. Yeah. And they changed that to where now at the very top of the clip in the actual track, you could just grab it and move it where you want it. But that tool was gone. That was like a 20 minute investigation (laughs) for me to figure out why that tool was gone or missing out of there. So developers can really mess with you, what I'm getting at, by moving some of the stuff around. That's an interesting point. And I agree that there are some things that you could change that make stuff uh, a little bit more, you know, confusing because you have to relearn some stuff. However, in the case of the arrow, the two arrows thing, if you counted at the time, there was eight different buttons that had an arrow and they were not clear what they did. (laughs) So true. I think it is an improvement to. Oh, it's an improvement. You know, <laughs> once you learn that that tool's there and that's how you do something, and the next you update and suddenly that thing's gone. You're yeah, like, for sure. What the heck? <laughs> well, it's kind of nice because it's 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 more in line with traditional video editors like yes. Caden Live and, and right, yeah, DaVinci. So you just you know grab the track and move it. So it makes more sense. <laughs> totally <laughs> does. I actually love it now, and I've gotten used to it very quick. And maybe they had a guide because I'm known to kind of just with screens pop up to click past it to get into my work. But if they didn't, they need to make sure that when they make a change like that, that maybe they have a pop up that says, hey, here's the changes and note this is gone. And, you know, to when they do an update, because I think it throw people off. But otherwise, I, I just love Audacity. Uh, and I tested out this performance. Hardware Addicts is definitely... Uh, recorded in very high definition sound and being able to load the tracks of Wendy, Michael, and myself Mm -hmm. quickly to start editing um, can be an issue uh, or has been an issue before as far as time goes. And it is much, much faster than it was before. So they've definitely done some great work there. Oh, awesome. And, you know, Audacity is so important to our software ecosystem. It is the cross-platform open source Swiss Army knife for audio editing, recording, and converting audio files. And you can use it on on Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. And you know, th- as a result, this is the tool I show my students to quickly convert their audio files to other file formats or make mic recordings for use in their multimedia projects. So this it, it, Audacity, it's been around for years and years, and it's perfect for that. And in fact. Right now, me, Michael, and Ryan are using it for the show to make high-quality local audio recordings from our mics. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So. And it's, it's interesting because like the, the Audacity is a very useful tool. And I always looked at Audacity as like, well, I kind of tried not to look at Audacity because it didn't look that very good. You know, <laughs> the design of Audacity needs some improvement. But... Uh, I always looked at it as a tool that can do like the basics and stuff, but then I started like playing with all the different effects and the filters and everything you can do with Audacity. It is very mm-hmm. powerful. So uh, for the past f- few years, when since we started doing podcasting, I started like improving the audio quality of the show by using Audacity's uh, effects, and you can do like EQing and filter curve stuff. You can do compressors and all sorts of stuff. It is very very powerful for what it is. It doesn't look like it's a professional tool. But it can do professional work. It's amazing. So as soon as they get the UI to ma- match its its availability of features, then it will be. I think it'll be a lot more popular, even so though it's already on the, the inside that counts, Michael. Not what's on the outside. Yes, I mean that's first a good impressions analogy. are important, sir. <laughs> they are very important in mis- m- many cases, including <laughs> audio editors. 
But I do think it's cool. And also the whole telemetry thing, um, it's really interesting because that they did revert some of it, but it was always an opt-in thing. So you'd have to choose to send it off. People were just like not uh, on board with what they were sending it to. And now they're going to be doing it in a much different way. So it's a little bit, you know, it's still some, they're still doing some telemetry aspect, but it's not as much of a like, you know, all hands on deck, you just tack them kind of thing because it is opt-in. If you don't want to send them the stuff, you don't have to, so... And when we talk about classics, project was started in the fall of 1999. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. It was when Audacity <laughs> came by Dominic wow. Mazzoni and Roger yeah. Dannenberg at Carnegie Mellon University and released on May 28th, 2000 as version 0.8. So as we're talking about classics in history, there you go. This came out, you know, what, eight years after Linux was released? Yeah. This this software was one of the one of the pieces of software I I actually was able to tell my students to start using Linux because <laughs> they can use Audacity. Oh wow! Along, along with the GIMP nice. and, and several others, but <laughs> very cool. Yeah, well, speaking of 90s. classics, Jill. <laughs> yes. And we talk about gaming. Let's go into a Absolutely. classic game for our <laughs> audience. So today. We have a new take on the classic asteroids with asteroids extreme. Woohoo! <laughs> you said so, that so nice. Extreme. It's supposed to be like asteroids extreme. extreme. Oh. <laughs> She's like extreme. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't seem very extreme when you say it like that, Jill. Oh. All right, so, continue. Sorry. But that's okay. Most of us are probably familiar with this Atari classic from 1979 in the arcades and 1981 on Atari 2600. But just in case, this game describes itself on Steam like this. Head off into the asteroid field to seek your fortune. The asteroid field is full of quantum crystals for those foolish enough to brave the dangers of space. Risk and reward is the name of the game when it comes to crystal mining. Tensions rise as the asteroid field becomes more dense and alien rivals begin to take notice of your very unwelcome presence. Miners must work quickly to avoid attracting the attention of the most fearsome deep space inhabitants. Quite a bit more complex than the original as asteroids, would yeah. you say? I was say <laughs> did the original one have a storyline? Yeah, that's, I was about to no, ask the same question. No. I mean, or was it just trying to shoot at asteroids, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And many of us have sunk, you know, hundreds of hours playing the original asteroids. You know, I have fond memories of playing in the it in the arcades and on my Atari 2600, which I still have mm-hmm. in my museum. <laughs> and I even still play it in terminal on Linux. And you can even play a, an ASCII art version in the terminal, which is really fun with the AA library. <laughs> so, <laughs> awesome. And, well, actually, I've, I've, I've played Asteroids in the past before, and, um, and, I didn't, and this one has a story, so it gives a little bit more extra elements. Yeah. So that's interesting. And I, I looked at this, and I was thinking, like, maybe, I might, maybe it could trump Rocket League. Maybe not. Probably <laughs> not. But then, then I thought, I do want to play Asteroids Extreme. <laughs> Asteroids Extreme. I kind of want to do a competition. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun to see who's better at Asteroids between all of us? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Oh, better boy. at what? Yeah. Better who's, yeah. Be- who's the best at Asteroids between the three of us? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, what? Asteroids, Asteroids. Win? Asteroids what? <laughs> extreme. Extreme. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that so, was extreme. I would definitely that, do it. And I'll totally destroy competition. You. I, I'm going to no. mine would, so much crystals, whatever that was. Quantum yes. crystals. Quantum, quantum crystals. crystals. That's Clearly, good. that's why we would be out there shooting at asteroids. Come on, Michael. <laughs> Keep up with us, please. Quantum so, crystals. Not bad. <laughs> so what I think is cool is the asteroid... Asteroids Extreme takes it to the next level while keeping that old school charm. It has a very hypnotic soundtrack, which was really fun to listen to, and extremely colorful effects when you blast UFOs in space. Yes, there are UFOs, (laughs) not just asteroids, (laughs) to to explode. And you can buy it on on Steam for $7.99. So well worth it. Great value there. (laughs) That's an extremely good deal. Extreme. <laughs> Asteroids extreme. <laughs> Imagine doing like, I was thinking those monster truck commercials if Jill was the announcer. We're like, Sunday, monster Sunday, trucks are coming Sunday, in here. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, <laughs> monster <laughs> trucks. See, Gravedigger. <laughs> it's 
Sea <laughs> Grave Digger. That got me, Michael. <laughs> oh, that was so good. <laughs> so in our software spotlight this week, I wanted to pull another classic here. And if you love the MIDI sounds of classic NES or Famicom or Amiga or C64, then check out Fama Studio. This is a music creator that's open source and allows you to recreate or make your own unique MIDI tunes. Now, I never appreciated this type of music back in the day. When I would listen to it later on in life, of course, when I was growing up, it sounded fine. You're just playing your video games. But after that, you know, we got orchestra and you got Final Fantasy and games like that that brought in just this amazing music. And I lost all appreciation for MIDI sounds until I came across a very specific Twitch streamer. Mm. Uh, I don't think he streams anymore, but he is, his Twitch stream was Man vs. Game. And he had this fascination, this passion. That's why I love anybody that geeks out about something. And he geeked out about MIDI music. He would play it on his streams. When he would take a break, he would play this music. And he would talk about how amazing it was that these coders were able to take these very restrictive capabilities that they had and be able to create tunes and music out of it that stuck mm -hmm. with you for so long. At the beginning of this, I hummed a tune to Michael, and we were trying to guess what game it came from, but it was Final Fantasy. But the fact is that that stuck with us, mm -hmm. right? That we knew it was between Mario or Final Fantasy was one of the games. Well, that's interesting. I actually have a song that's been stuck in my head since the 90s that's from a video game. And it's exact for that reason. It's just like constantly in my head. It's from a NBA oh. Live 95. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. And I have no idea why it's still there, but it's still there. And it's and I, the MIDI sounds is interesting because it's like uh, you, what you were saying about how these you know you're not thinking about it as a, a possible like something to be good. They there's a lot of effort back in the day for doing this, but they also had like partnerships with composers to make the sounds like to work with the MIDI sounds and the eight bit tones and stuff like that mm -hmm. to make these interesting pieces of music. And to the point where I started getting into that sort of music, and I found a fantastic genre which is a combination of EDM. And MIDI 8-bit gaming sounds called Chip Tune. Chip Tunes. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Jill, awesome. you knew that. I didn't know about Chip Tunes, but Jill knew it instantly. Oh yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> of course, Jill did. <laughs> of course, Jill did. She probably composed. Some. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to a couple of concerts too. From some... oh, I didn't even know they had Chip Tune concerts. Now I, yeah. I want to go to those. Yeah. At Maker Fair, Maker Fair is a good place to go to Chip Tune. That'd concerts. be awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Well, when you think about classics like Zelda or Mega Man and some of these Marios and even the original Final Fantasies and things like that, and just the amazing, like I said, they, they didn't have as many tools, they didn't have the ability to use as many tools as we can today in a video game, but they were still able to create tracks that we remember for a lifetime. And you could check out this Fama Studio. It comes preloaded with tracks. So I was able to take some tracks. Uh, it has some ones already created and then you can add stuff to it. So you don't have to develop a whole track by yourself. Or you could, of course, download some of those tracks from the internet of some of your favorite games and modify them and play with them and have some fun. But it's a really cool open source project that I thought fit mm -hmm. this classic themed episode perfectly. The tip of the week this week is another kind of classic tool, but I also want to do a little bit of like a, you know, there's there's some modern tools that do this functionality. Uh, so I want to talk about those first. So we're going to talk about disk usage and be able to see the information from the disk usage. So there's GNOME disks you can use in uh, GTK tools. There's also KDE tools, where they have the Info Center device viewer that you can give you the details about the disk usage. And you can also use a terminal application that is powered by InCurses, and it's called NCDU for InCurses disk usage and it is fantastic i use ncdu all the time i've been using it for so many years even though i know the gooey things are there it's just so fast ncdu is so fast it takes like 30 seconds to scan your whole system and then tells you what what uh, the stuff is you can just use your arrow keys to navigate and it actually has like keyboard shortcuts to easily delete things you just hit d to delete and that sort of stuff i mean be careful with you know deleting things because it is it's <laughs> going to delete it on your file system but it's really cool. And they've had a recent release of like a new version. So it's like a classics never die type of thing where like uh, I think last week they released NCDU 2.0 and it's even faster and it has even more cool features. Like I I'm a huge fan of NCDU. If you need to check out your disk usage on uh, you know any frequent basis and you want the fastest approach, in my opinion, I think the NCDU is the go-to for the speed. Now, if you want a GUI, 
that's not necessarily what he's, <laughs> he's going to give you. But, uh, you know, we've, for those who have listened to the show for a while, you might have been, or especially with the live streams, you not, might be aware that there's been times where I'd had, you know, maybe too much of my disc used and then I'd run out of space. I mean, that's only happened maybe like seven, eight times. I don't remember. <laughs> but it's happened enough where I basically have like just in, like instinct now to check to see how much storage space I have like in CDU. And it's just, you know, anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> NCDU is an awesome tool. And if you need to check your, your disk usage, uh, check it out. Or you could also use the GUI tools from GNOME, KDE, and others. Very nice. So thanks to Dur Hands for sending us some of these periodically about events going on in the Linux community. I want to go through a couple that you need to mark your calendars for. Of course, we have Fostum, which is February 5th and 6th. So that's coming up here right around the corner. And Fostum is a free event for software developers to meet, share ideas, and collaborate. Every year, thousands of developers from free and open source software from all around the world gather at this event in Brussels. But this year, it's online. So it's kind of a unique opportunity to be able to partake in this event uh, if you were never able to travel to it before. So mark your calendars for February 5th and 6th, and we'll have links in the show notes uh, to join that. We also have Linux Fest Northwest. It's virtual as well, only this year, April 22nd through the 24th. And again, presentations from open source topics, Linux distributions, InfoSec privacy, all kinds of things there uh, to sink your teeth in on April 22nd through the 24th. And then we have Scale. Jill, we need the mandatory penguin hat to be on <laughs> yes. uh, because assuming it happens in person, you yeah, can look for that penguin. hat and you will see Jill. <laughs> Uh, So if you want to meet Jill, you can look for that hat and see Jill there at scale. This is the 19th annual Southern California Linux Expo. It'll be taking place on March 3rd through the 6th in Pasadena, California. And this is one of the largest open source software conferences in North America to check out. Mm -hmm. And also we got an email this morning from Durhans for another one for FOSS Asia. So we'll have details about all of these in the show notes. So check those out. So a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. And we're here every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, live at dlnlive.com. And the best part is everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week for free. And we can't wait to see you in the chat. And of course, we also have our glorious patrons, which get perks like unedited versions of the show. They get to hang out with us in the patron post show. And they're in the super secret virtual stadium right now where they have no delay from stuff where they get to message us directly. And of course, we'll be hanging out with them after mm-hmm. the show. If you want more information on that, go to destinationlinux.org slash Patreon. And also, we have some exciting news to tell you about. <laughs> and that is the DLNstore.com has been updated and Jill's shirt is now available. Aww. You can go check it out. There's also, you can get uh, you can get the Jill, the 33% more Jill on mugs. You can get it on stickers, like all sorts of stuff. Plus, we have some more things that are in the store right now. So you can get t-shirts, hoodies, mugs. Uh, like I said, stickers. Also, so much cool stuff. And there's even some really interesting, you can get like, instead of just stickers, maybe you want to have some magnets to put on your I refrigerator, want Jill for everything. example. Yeah. I want exactly. Jill <laughs> mouse. I want Jill mouse pads. I want Jill shirts. Yeah, there's I want Jill even, There's even like a desk mat, not even yeah, just a mouse man. pad there's a desk yes, which is just awesome it. so deal in store.com to check those out this is how important you are Jill, to us we <laughs> oh. fired our prior vendor for not getting the shirt out soon enough yep. that's true and now we have a new <laughs> vendor just to get jill's shirt so it's available finally we, we completely oh changed vendors because so they honored. wouldn't let us have the jill shirt and like no no no, no. <laughs> yeah it's still in review no it isn't we don't care yeah we said not in review and i <laughs> And make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on the Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, DLN Extend, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and the Fedora Podcasts. Everyone head to destinationlinux.network and subscribe to all these great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a wonderful week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Oh, real quick in the chat, someone said, hey, does that mouse pad have a radio built into it? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice callback. I love when people do callbacks. <laughs> For those who don't you, know, that's Ariane. a Jill's treasure hunt. Yeah. I'll have it linked in the show notes. 
a fantastic episode. Check it out. (laughs) 